Bruchem Aboyim, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, this week, on my thoughts, I would like to examine uh, the concept of motivation. What is it that motivates us to serve God Almighty? As it states in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, Antigonus of Soho would say in connection with our service to God Almighty, Do not be like servants who serve their master for the sake of receiving a reward, but rather <clears throat> be like servants who serve their master without the intent of receiving any reward. Two people can perform the exact same act, and yet their motivation can be worlds apart. One person can be focused on profit, honor, self, and grandizement, whereas the other person can be focused on altruistic goals that connect them with their creator and bestows benefits on other people as well. You know, serving God Almighty can be approached in different ways. One may serve God for the reward that they feel they will receive for their service, what, what God will do for them. Or one may serve God with the intent that they wish to cultivate a loving relationship with their creator, their father in heaven. What can they do for God? One can serve God out of fear, fear of punishment or retribution, or they can serve God out of love and awe, a selfless connection to their loving Father in heaven. You know, God Almighty has given us his precious Torah as an instruction manual. He expects us to adhere to all that the Torah requires us to follow. Now, regardless of our motivation, we have an obligation to fulfill all of his commandments. But our motivation as to whether we observe his commandments out of love or fear, well, that is our choice. Nonetheless, whatever our, our motivation may be, observing them is not a choice. It is an obligation. Our sages tell us that a person repents out of fear, well, their reward is a thousandfold. However, if they repent out of love, what we refer to as tshuva me ahava, then the reward is doubled, 2,000-fold. In fact, we are told by our sages that if a person repents out of love, that they are not only forgiven for their transgression, they actually have the ability to tra transform their transgressions, their negative actions, into a positive connection to God Almighty. Since it was their intense regret that brought them closer to God, it can transform their sin into a mitzvah, actually into a good deed. We read in the opening verse in the portion of Lech Lecha that God Almighty tells Avram Ravino, Abraham our father, to leave his land, to leave his birthplace, and to leave his father's house, and to travel to the land that God would show him. In return for his subservience, God stated that I will make you into a great nation, I will bless you and make you great. You shall become a blessing, and I will bless all those who bless you, and he who curses you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, this was considered to be the first of the ten tests that Abravino, Abraham, our father, would undergo. God Almighty had previously saved him from a fiery furnace, that being the case. There was every reason for Avram to believe that God could and would indeed fulfill all the promises that he made. So, so following God's command would seem to be a no-brainer. Then why would this be called a test? So Avram's test was not whether he would follow God's command or not. No. The test was would, what would be the motivation for him to follow God's command. Was it due to all the blessings that God had promised that he would receive? Or was it due to the fact that the driving force in his life, his motivation, was to follow God Almighty in all that he requested of him? The answer to this question is found in the very next verse. There it states that Abraham went as God had directed him. So we see that his only motivation was to follow God's command. It was not done for his own benefit. It was only done to fulfill the will of God Almighty. This is in contrast to his nephew Lot, who accompanied him, whose only motivation in following Avram was for his own personal gain. 
He saw his uncle as a wealthy man with no heirs, since at that time Avram had not yet fathered any children. So Lot saw it as advantageous for himself to cultivate a relationship with his wealthy elderly uncle. We see another example of Avram's dedication to God Almighty with the Akedus Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak. God did not command Avram to bring Yitzchak up as a sacrifice. God only requested that he do so. The Hebrew word that God used is no, please, a request. Avram Vino's only motivation was to serve his maker. God's request was in total opposition to everything, everything that Abraham, Avram had spent his whole life fighting against, human sacrifices. God had requested that Avram Vino the kindness of all men, to sacrifice his righteous son, the son that he loved most dearly, the son that he had fathered when he was 100 years of age. In fact, this was the same son that God Almighty had told him would carry on his legacy. So by sacrificing his son, he would destroy everything that he had created in the past, in addition to sabotaging any chance of succeeding in the future with one stroke of a knife. He, would, he was ending both of their lives. He would have thought that Avram Vina would have had pleaded with God to save the life of his beloved son. But what we miss, witness is just the opposite. The Torah tells us that he got up early in the morning and though he was a wealthy man with many servants, he saddled his own donkey. His only motivation was to serve God even if it went totally against his nature. Based on logic, Avramavinu could not have foreseen any benefit to himself. He could only have envisioned pain and grief, and yet he didn't hesitate. He performed God's request with an alacrity. Our sages tell us that during the 22-year period that Yaakovinu and Yosef were separated, that Yaakov was in a state of despondency. We are told by our sages that the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, cannot shine on a person who is in a state of sadness. That being the case, for those 22 years that Yaakov was separated from his favorite son, Yosef, he had no direct communication with God Almighty. Knowing that, we really have to wonder how was it possible at the Akedah that an angel of God was able to communicate with Avram Avinu. This is proof positive that every act that he performed in the service of God Almighty brought him immense joy so his only motivation in all of his actions was always to connect to God. That joy of fulfilling the will of God, not his own, was enough to allow an angel to appear to him and stop him from bringing Yitzhak up as a sacrifice. Now the state of Israel and Hamas are facing a life and death struggle. What is their motivation? Khomeini, the previous leader of Iran, a known state sponsor of terrorist organizations worldwide, stated, Our stance against Israel is the same stance we have always taken. Israel is a malignant, cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated. It is possible, and it will happen. The, the, the mantra that is constantly repeated by Iran and all of its terrorist, terrorist progeny is, Palestine is from the river, to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. This is Palestine and Jerusalem is its irrefutable, irrefutable, pardon me, capital. It is their sworn mission to wipe out all Jews wherever they reside. You know, it's not coincidental that the word Hamas in Hebrew denotes immorality, violence, oppression, cruelty, and outrage. I recently heard a terrorist leader follow, telling his followers with passion about the glory of dying the death of a martyr and the holy mission of killing the Jews. No, no civilized nation or army would, would or could perpetrate such acts of barbarism and brutality against helpless women and children, many of whom were sleeping in their cribs. That is in addition to the rape and mutilation of bodies, all in the name of Allah, and the oppression of their own people. The true oppressors of the residents of Gaza are Hamas. They prevented the refugees from leaving the north. 
This allowed Hamas to use them as human shields, since they intermingled with the populace to go undetected. They have received billions of dollars in financial aid, which was intended to help the people. Instead, Hamas has used it to construct tunnels and to build up their weapon stockpiles. That is, rather than constructing power plants to supply electricity and other essential amenities needed by all the residents of Gaza. The populace are living in poverty, while the head of Hamas is living it up in a luxury penthouse in Quatrain. It has been reported that he has a net worth somewhere in the, in, the, in the neighborhood of $11 billion. This is the organization whom the world is protesting for. So let us look at the motivation of the Israelis. This is not just one battle or one war. The Israelis only have one choice. Either they win or they die. The set massacre of October 7th tells the whole story. The terrorists killed anyone and everyone that they could, raping women and dismembering bodies. They joyfully took videos of their actions as was viewed on the body camps of those Hamas terrorists who were captured or killed. This is in addition to the eyewitness reports from the press, those who were allowed to view the carnage. I think that many of the protesters believe that they and Hamas are on the same page. Well, think again. If anyone in the crowd is gay, well, they better leave before Hamas finds you. If they do, they will kill you. The same is true with the whole LGBTQ community. Women have no rights. They are the slaves of their husbands. In Islam, it's a man's world. A wife cannot refuse any of her husband's demands. Tel Aviv, in contrast, is rated as the third best city in the world for gays to live in. Israelis are the most humane soldiers in the world. You have never heard of, Israeli, of an Israeli soldier raping an Arab woman. Is there any other nation that drops leaflets warning the civilian populace that they are about to bomb a building so that they can all evacuate? There were bombing missions that were halted because of the concern about civilian casualties. Bottom line, Hamas's motivation is death and destruction whereas the Israeli motivation is peace and life. All the teachings of the Torah are based on the concept of the Chayb Mohem, that the dedication of Jews to God Almighty and His Torah are all predicated on the preservation of life and not death. The world is calling for a ceasefire, a true demonstration of kindness, kindness at someone else's expense. Let us look into modern-day history. President Harry Truman, decided that rather than fighting a long, protracted war by invading the Japanese mainland, that the United States would drop the atom bomb on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These bombs killed an estimated 286,818 men, women, and children. But it resulted in a swift end <clears throat> to the war in the Pacific. The Japanese surrendered. It had been estimated that an invasion of the island of Japan would have cost the lives of millions of American soldiers and many more that would have been injured. Truman saw that as unacceptable. We end the first blessing in the Amida, the standing prayer, three times daily with the Hebrew words, Mogain Abraham, which means the shield of Abraham. Simply understood, we are beseeching God Almighty, our Father in heaven, to protect us in the merit of our forefather, Avram Avinu. But there may well be another lesson for us to learn here. Avram Avinu, Abraham our father, was the paradigm of kindness. Though kindness is essential for a meaningful life, it should not be confused with weakness. <clears throat> that is what I believe the words, the shield of Avram, may well teach us. Respect and suspect. Unbridled kindness can be detrimental to your health. There can be no ceasefire. Hamas is even worse than ISIS. They are a cancer, and if left to live, they will return again and again. These are religious zealots who believe in martyrdom. We are witnessing that the seed of evil is rising across the globe. Hate crimes against Jews are up all over the world. It is not just the Jews of Israel that are under attack. We as Jews, in some small way, share some of the same concerns that all Israeli families are experiencing. 
So what do we do? The world com community is fickle and easily bored. They are much like a parent who says to his children who are fighting with each other. I don't care who is right or who is wrong. I just want quiet. Our salvation is not in the hands of man. Our strength has and always will be Kol Yaakov, the voice of Yaakov. Our whole existence has been a long chain of miracles orchestrated by our loving Father in heaven. You know, Frederick the Great was a great philosopher. <clears throat> he enjoyed <clears throat> having intellectual debates with his archbishop. One day, the topic of their the debate was, can you prove that there is a God in the world? So, for every proof that the archbishop stated, Frederick presented a counter-argument. Finally, with nothing else left, the archbishop turned to Frederick and he said, the proof that there is a God in the world hmm, is that there is still a Jew in the world. Frederick smiled and said, I accept that. So let us all lift up our voices to God, our Father in heaven, and say to him that it is time. It's time to end all the hatred and bigotry that exists in the world today. It is time to put an end to Jewish blood being sacrificed. It is time for us to be what God Almighty created us to be, a light unto the nations. It is time for all Jews worldwide to show strength and solidarity, especially with our brethren in Israel. Let us pray for the hostages and their safe return. Let us pray for all those who have been injured physically and emotionally. Let us pray for all the brave Israeli soldiers that have been forced to be in harm's way. Let us pray that God Almighty frees, cures, heals, and protects all of us. Let us pray that the time has come for God Almighty to reveal to the world all of his glory. Look around you. All the signs of Mashiach are here. We pray that you bestow your goodness upon all of us with the coming of Mashiach Tzukenu. Now, Am Yisrael Chai. Again, I want to thank you for listening, for attending. It's a very special time in history. And it's a time where we all need to come together. Please, again, support Israel. Support our brothers and sisters, all 7.5 million of them. If you can, please donate. But again, have them in your thoughts and in your prayers. May God Almighty save Israel. He may bring Mashiach now. Again, thank you for listening. Again, this lecture will be followed by a original song that I have written, and I hope you uh, stick around and listen to it. Thank you very much for attending. God bless and be well.